This unit covers the topic of cervical length measurement during the second and third trimesters of pregnancy. The measurement of cervical length through transvaginal ultrasound provides valuable insights for identifying and treating a variety of critical clinical conditions. These conditions range from preterm labor and induction of labor to prolonged pregnancies, timing of repeat C-sections, and management of polyhydramnios. Compared to transabdominal and transperineal cervical length measurements, transvaginal ultrasound is superior in accuracy and usefulness. The cervical length and Bishop score are essential factors that can predict the success of labor induction. Patients who deliver within 24 hours have an average cervical length of 23.1 mm, while those who deliver after 24 hours have an average cervical length of 31.3 mm. A cervical length of 20 mm during labor induction at terms strongly predicts the unlikelihood of a C-section. The chance for spontaneous labor at 41 weeks is more likely in white, multi-gravid women and more significant when the maternal body mass index, BMI, is lower, and the sonographic cervix length is shorter. Further, these factors can define the probability of spontaneous labor and the risk of C-section in the week following the 41st week of pregnancy. This chart displays the percentage of women who deliver within 24 hours during labor induction at 41 and 3 7 to 42 and 1 7 weeks, based on their transvaginal cervical length. It highlights the correlation between cervical length and the likelihood of women delivering within 24 hours. In women with polyhydramnios, the cervix gradually shortens until the critical cutoff of 15 mm is met, which is associated with early gestational age at delivery. The following charts demonstrate the process for measuring cervical length. The anatomic landmarks to consider are the maternal bladder fetal presentation, the cervical canal, the internal and external cervical os, and the vagina. To measure cervical length, the mother should empty her bladder, and a sterile probe cover must be used. The probe is inserted into the vagina towards the fornix, while measurements should be avoided during a uterine contraction. Optimal measurements require gain, zoom, and focal zone adjustments. The cervix is imaged horizontally in the middle of the ultrasound screen after selecting a sagittal plane. It's important to avoid applying too much pressure on the probe during the measurement process. When the canal is identified, gently withdraw the probe slightly. Place the measurement cursors at the closing points of the internal and external os, then measure the distance between them. When the mother is lying on her back, these images show the correct orientation of the vaginal ultrasound transducer probe in relationship to the maternal feet and head and the maternal orientation to the posterior and anterior. The bladder in yellow, cervical canal, internal and external cervical os, and vagina are standard anatomic landmarks. The fetal presenting part is closest to the internal cervical os. This image shows a sagittal view of the cervix captured through a transvaginal ultrasound. It includes essential anatomical landmarks that have been illustrated. The image quality has been optimized by adjusting the gain, zoom, and focal zone. A strict sagittal plane was maintained to capture the entire cervix. The cervical canal is visible in the middle of the screen, although this may be impossible if the cervix is anterior. In summary, the probe is slightly withdrawn after locating the cervical canal, and the measurement cursors are carefully placed at the points where the internal and external cervical os are close. Measure the distance between these points accurately. To locate the internal os, look for a small triangle and place the cursor at its apex, the closing point. For the external os, follow the posterior cervical lip until you identify the point where it closes.
This image is suboptimal due to incomplete visualization of the cervix and poor definition of the internal and external cervical os, although the cervical length appears normal. In the image, the caliper placement is imprecise, and the distal cervix is incompletely visualized, obstructing the recognition of the external cervical os. It is essential to avoid putting too much pressure on the probe when examining the cervix. Additionally, it is necessary to ensure that the thickness of the anterior and posterior lips of the cervix is uniform. This image showed a noticeable difference in the thickness of the anterior and posterior cervical lips. The circular areas that are outlined indicate contractions in the lower uterine segment. This image also demonstrates the effects of uterine contractions on the cervix, which has an S-shaped canal, and asymmetry between its anterior and posterior lips. In summary, Several anatomic challenges may hinder the identification of the internal cervical os, including an underdeveloped lower uterine segment, focal myometrial contractions, spontaneous cervical change, and endocervical lesions like polyps. Technical pitfalls can occur due to incorrect vaginal probe orientation and cervical distortion caused by the probe. One study found that individuals preparing for transvaginal cervical length measurement can learn how to adequately perform the transvaginal ultrasound exam. The study showed that those with no prior experience could perform the exam correctly after 18 consecutive ultrasound examinations, while individuals with prior experience only required one practice session to learn the technique. This image shows a clear sagittal view of the cervix with proper cursor placement for measurement. The image obtained through transvaginal ultrasound depicts a shortened cervix and the visible presence of both the amnion and chorion. There is no indication of cervical shortening in the initial transvaginal ultrasound image over a two-minute observation window. Note the time which is recorded on the image. There is now clear and conclusive evidence of spontaneous cervical shortening, two minutes after the previous image. In this transvaginal ultrasound image, the membranes fill the upper vagina. The internal cervical os dilation is approximately 2.5 cm, and the external cervical os dilation is approximately 5.2 cm. This cervical insufficiency image shows a U-shaped funnel measuring 20 mm and a cervical length measuring 21 mm. In this image, there is a V-shaped funnel with a short cervix. The distal cervix is poorly visualized. This is an example of a transabdominal ultrasound up to the cervical length when the maternal bladder is distended. This technique is not recommended for accurate cervical length measurements compared to the transvaginal approach. This image shows intact suture material and a short cervix, 9.8 mm, following surgical placement of the suture. This is a transabdominal suture that is used to reinforce the cervix. A transvaginal ultrasound was performed, and it showed that the mersaline tape ligature is visible and there is no significant cervical shortening. Some ultrasound labs outline the endocervical canal, as shown in this image, especially when a significantly curved canal exists. However, measuring the distance between cursors is preferable, except in extreme cases.